I think I just had to change the thumb right now. I think I'm live. You live, baby? Sick. Is it backwards? Hey, can you guys hear me? They should still be able to hear you. That might be it. Can I get, get something in the chat if you guys can hear me? Type in the chat. Can you guys hear me? Evan Tucker, yeah, that's a big true man. man, sick. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Uh, you still don't know. Yeah, go eat. Yeah, yeah, you're fine. You're fine. We're chilling. I'm just gonna talk for a little bit. Who? BPN. I know who you are. BPN. All right, sick. Okay, guys, we'll give everybody a minute to get in here. <clears throat> um, man, I drank a lot of caffeine before this. <sighs> I'm feeling a little bit crazy right now. <clears throat> Marcus Mayorga, Josue in the chat, looking good, guys. We have 10 participants. Wow. The big first video here. So, guys, I didn't do all the questions. I just did, like, uh, people logging off already. The fuck? Already lost people. We're, uh, <clears throat> I didn't do all the questions because it was gonna be a lot and i don't know i don't know exactly how long this uh this video is gonna be or not so i went through and, and picked like the first probably <clears throat> i picked the wing four like philosophical ones i'll just talk and, and answer some questions and then i'm gonna hop in and do like a couple technique ones that that we did so pretty much just went in order actually i did 100 percent go in order so i'll go down the line and i got some notes here and stuff um you guys can jump in the cat chat with like, more questions and stuff like that but for the most part i just wanted to have some structure to it um because sometimes i see people getting on q a's and it's just a shit show of like weird questions and stuff like that's not really prepared or anything like that so i wanted to have some kind of structure or something going into it um, so that's why I'm putting the option to, to put questions on the discord. And then once you guys are, are, uh, <clears throat> like asking those questions, I can kind of plan for them a little bit and things like that. So I can answer them well, and, uh, you guys can give me feedback throughout the, throughout the video so that, um, I can elaborate on parts or, or whatever, or we can keep to try to keep to like a similar track with it or something like that. So you guys feel free. Cause this is like an interactive uh, experience here. I don't want to, I would just made a video if I wanted to just ask the question or just answer your questions. I would just made a video. You know what I mean? So it's going to be an interactive thing here for sure. And I see you guys on the chat and everything like that. So just, uh, just interact with me here and, uh, and, and I'll get started. Okay. Cause my as well, if I'm talking fast, it's because of the caffeine. Yeah, I see you, D-Money. Biggest troll in the game. I love you, buddy. All right. Um, the first one was Jillian Navarez. He says, what do you think about JT Torres? No gi style and how to use him his techniques. <clears throat> JT is a uh, phenomenal CC performance and things like that. Um, he is solid all the way around you know he's he's the type of guy that if you want to if you want to get um if you want to have a style that is bulletproof you know he's a good guy to look at it's very fundamental um it's also pretty explosive and, and tight um you know really i think i think jt is is definitely one of the pinnacles of the sport and i think he's actually underrepresented and 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 underappreciated as well he <sighs> I think part of the reason in my head that, that JT is, is underappreciated is because he didn't necessarily, he won the ADCC title last, the last ADCC, but at, at 76, 77 kilos. But I think one of the issues was, was he, he didn't win it. He got second before to, to uh, maybe Cron. And then I think the year before that to Marcelo, he lost as well. I'd have to go back and see, man, that, that could be, I could be giving out false information, but I think sometimes that, kind of like because those guys didn't go to adcc after that so he never beat them to win it um it could be a reason why he's overlooked a little bit possibly but i mean he's undoubtedly um the champ at 77 milligrams i mean i don't want to fucking you know nobody wants a piece of that guy he's 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 very untouchable you know he's he's i saw him with wagner um and it was it was one of the one of the most like defining matches i've seen against wagner rocha it was really really impressive performance 
Um, oh, and, and techniques, as far as techniques, not too much. Um, the guy, he, there's one thing that I definitely actually use consistently. And I just picked this up like a year ago or so. And it was like, uh, he does this thing like a hump, right? Like, um, from half guard, imagine I'm in half guard here and he does this thing where he gets really low and he climbs and he humps up the leg like this and he gets up the knee. Sorry for the visual there, but like he, he climbs up the knee line in that little humping motion like that. And he does it really well. And that was like a really cool, like little tip I picked up from him. Um, and then I think using the inside trip I got, I got from him too, because I, I used to use the inside trip a lot in wrestling and, uh, <clears throat> I didn't think I should use it as much in jiu-jitsu because he'd fall into the guard, but I, I think uh, I think it's a very useful technique, and, and I've seen him use it in different in different capacities. Okay, next question. With that Any questions on JT? Okay, this was uh, this was from Daniel Melendez. Did any one wrestler influence your style, and if so, who? This was a question for me actually, and uh, and I didn't want to leave like many. I didn't want to leave anybody hanging. This is a complex thing because I um, didn't. We didn't. I didn't grow up in a YouTube era or a, like an Instagram era. So like there wasn't people like there weren't a whole lot of resources for watching jujitsu. Really, the only like jujitsu that I consistently watched was uh, like a senior nationals tape that like you would have to buy, I'd have to buy VHSs. And, uh, and when we went to tournaments and stuff like that, they would sell uh, tournaments on VHS. And so I'd watch myself a lot and I'd watch these VHSs that I had. And um, there's a couple guys that I would watch on the VHSs, like Brett, Brett Metcalf stands out and stuff. Um, but most of, most of the things that I picked up and the people that I watched growing up wrestling was, um, Oh, and then and then I got into yeah okay there was there was a highlight video I'll I'll go down the line okay because I, I made a list I made a list this will be this will be fun okay so the first first and foremost the biggest the biggest influence and one hundred percent is is my father uh, Neil Barge he right off the bat was was kind of putting these different ideas into my head about what uh, a wrestler was and what was important in wrestling and things like that from a young age um, and that was like a switch, um, a switch is like a particular technique that, that you use in wrestling. And he was known for, for using a switch from everywhere. And, and it was being like being very versatile from against shots and, and from standing and, and all sorts of things like that. So the switch became like a big part of my game early on. And that was like, that pertained particularly to the hips too, because that one of the first things he ever told me was, was hips. Like wrestling is all about hips and whoever has the best hips in, in a scramble or something like that, um, is, uh, is, you know, the, the going to be the, the one that comes out on top, you know, cause in wrestling you want to be on top. Um, Nico. Yeah. I mean, yeah, my, my dad was, my dad was a really good wrestler. Um, or, you know, he was a good wrestler and, uh, my uncles and, and things like that. So not a, not a, not a huge wrestling family, but definitely a wrestling family. You know, there, there's, there's like wrestling families. And then there's like, you know, my, there was wrestling in my family and, and especially with my father who was, he wrestled in college and um, did, did well in Pennsylvania. We came from kind of like a culture of, of wrestling. And uh, so <clears throat> about the hips, the hips was big from him. Having a strong back, I'll never forget the day when he told me, like, uh, when I was young, really young, he told me that, like, wrestling is all about pooling, right? Right. Wrestling is all about bringing somebody in. We're rarely trying to push somebody in wrestling. And so, like, he, he told me how important it was to, to, to pool, and, and wrestlers have the biggest backs and the strongest backs. And uh, that was, like, the day I got a pull-up bar. And uh, I used that pull-up bar from the age of like 12 until it's still it's still hanging up in my room at home, actually. And, you know, it's like it's taped up and bolted to the wall and also all sorts of crazy ways because it, it's been up there for so long and it was used for so many years. It's bending in the middle and stuff because, um, yeah, so strong back. That was huge. That was a big thing that he instilled in me. And I think to this day, I think my body locks and, and all my all my stuff is, is really strong because I started from a young age kind of getting my back strong. Um, and then, uh, you know, just the grind too. He told a lot of stories. Um, he told a lot of stories to me about wrestlers that, that he knew growing up and, um, more famous wrestlers in, in Western Pennsylvania. And, uh, 
and about what he had to do cutting weight and and uh and just you know crazy crazy stories man crazy old school wrestling stories he told me a lot of those and and that instilled a, a sense of like what i wanted to how I wanted to grind and how I wanted to, to participate in, in such a, a grueling thing and, and, and challenging uh, sport. You know, I really, I really admired it. And, and it was interesting to me because I saw a lot of wrestling dads that actually uh, pushed their kids into wrestling and pushed their kids into, into these sports and, and wrestling dads were sometimes the worst men and, and kids ended up quitting and things like that. And I'm sure it could be said the same for jujitsu. Um, <clears throat> hang on a second, man. Um, but you know, with with him, it was just more about uh, telling stories and making me interested. You know, he he went about it in a smart and sneaky way. You know, and and kind of tricked me into it. And he made me do gymnastics and a bunch of other weird stuff that that made me athletic in a weird way. Um, but didn't didn't ever push wrestling. He just you know kind of instilled in me how how cool it was. You know, and uh, and I appreciate that. That was that was a cool way to go about it. Did you become more of a pressure or technique wrestler? Um, I was more of a funky wrestler, man. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, actually. Um, pressure for sure. Um, technique. Yeah, it was technical, but it was weird. It was weird technical. Okay. I think in my case, I, I, I couldn't really fall into a category too well. And I think I'll, I'll get to that in a minute because I'm going to go over a few more guys here. Okay. Because this is a pretty good list. I'll, I'll try to make it shorter once I got past my father there. Um, Kurt Howe was, was really the first guy, um, when I started in Pee Wee's, you guys can look all these guys up from here on out pretty much. Um, Kurt Howe was, was, uh, he was an Olympic alternate and, uh, he was the Pee Wee's coach and he was also the high school coach at the time and, and a good friend of my father's. And, um, he was, he was the first guy that I really got to see what a wrestler looked like, you know, like a real wrestler looked like, like, you know, short that they had that funny walk and the funny ears and all that craziness. And, and that was like, you know, I saw, I saw something interesting in that. That was, that was cool. He influenced me in that kind of way. Um, a lot of mindset things and, and grinding and certain things like that. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So this is, this is, and then, and then um, actually an interesting one you guys should look up maybe is Wade Chalice. Wade Chalice was another guy that my dad introduced me to um, who influenced my style a little bit because he was uh <coughs> He was another funky guy, and uh, my dad used to tell me stories about Wade Chalice, and uh, he went to Clarion University in Pennsylvania, and he was a national champ, and he was this tall, skinny dude, and he didn't use, like, normal technique or anything like that, and he would throw everybody, and he would go out into the mat um, in the in the beginning of a, a match or whatever, when a dual meet, when everybody lined up, and he would go out and lick his fingers and, and, uh, and mark an X on the mat. And he would always pin the dude on that X. And so I'd watch some, like maybe some old stuff about him and, and, and my dad would teach me about him. But, um, as far as, uh, the next, the first, the first real highlight I ever saw was actually Ben Askren. And I was always really interested in wrestlers that were, that were good at wrestling. Um, despite not having like traditional physical attributes such as like speed and quickness and things like that. Cause you know, I was like, I was okay. I was like, not like, like really fast or, or too quick, but I was okay. Um, so I had to figure out like more funky ways. And Ben Askren was actually somebody that I watched um, at a young age in, in middle school or something like that. I found out about him um, back in like 04 or something. I think he was maybe like, I think he was still in high school, honestly. Um, I think it was a high school. It was like the first, uh, man, I don't know. It was the first wrestling highlight I ever saw in my life though um, on the internet or anything. And, uh, and so I watched Ben Askren and I, and I learned a lot about funk funk and funk was a big part of my game. Um, uh, funk being like just doing funky kind of different things and, and having good hips and things like that. Um, counter counter wrestling and things. <clears throat> Askren's performance in the UFC, particularly against Damian Maya. Poor guy, man. I don't know. <laughs> he didn't know what he was getting into. I think, uh, I think, uh, he, he did. He knew damn well what he was getting into, but I think maybe it was a little too late. I don't, I don't know. I wasn't impressed, though. But Ben Askren is a beast, man. I always respect him and and, and appreciate that guy. He, he was he was a huge inspiration for me. Um, so <clears throat> um, Kurt Hall again in high school. I wrote him down twice because he he was my he was still at the high school when I was a freshman, but he ended up uh, moving away and going to a different program. Um, Ian Moser was a kid. Um, you guys could look Ian Moser up. There's, there's stories about this kid. We ended up going to the same college later. Um, 
in uh, Pennsylvania and wrestling for the same college, but we went to different high schools. He was about three or four years older than me, maybe three years older than me. And Ian Moser was lighter than me, smaller than me. But he was a kid that I used to look at like, man, there's something like, there's something really interesting about this guy. And he, he's, you know, who he reminds me of in jujitsu is the Meow Brothers. He's very quiet and smaller and humble. And, and, uh, and I really, I really, really liked Ian Moser and, and nobody knew much about him. So there was a lot of like crazy stories about him. Um, like that he grew up next to a, I remember one story it was like he grew up next to a power plant and and something happened with uh his growth and then like they put him on some kind of like hormones or something there was like so many stories about this kid um that, that like high school and middle school kids would talk about him but he actually I learned elbow control the elbow control that I still use all the time I picked up from him and, and the sailor one of the sailors as well and I'll go over the sailors in a little bit but Ian Moser was a big influence for me man and, and I always appreciate that dude and, and love that guy because we ended up being really close in, in college and stuff um Kerry Collat Boom, that was a huge one. I, I almost forgot that earlier. Kerry Collat, a lot of you guys probably know Kerry Collat. When my dad, my dad watched Kerry Collat, um, he was a little younger than, than uh, my dad. My dad grew up in the same area of Pennsylvania. So my dad loved and watched and, and, and watched uh, Kerry Collat all through high school and stuff. So then when Kerry Collat, uh, <clears throat> he started, started to teach at a, a private school in Maryland called St. Paul's. And, uh, when we, <clears throat> we found that out, me and my dad, we started, they, he started driving me out to, it was like two hours away. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That's fucking sick, man. So such a, like the best high school wrestler of all time. And I'll stand by that forever, man. Um, he hit a, a backflip off the single leg and he was the first person to ever do that backflip off the single leg in the state finals of Pennsylvania. Come on, man. Anyways, we found out that, and I, my dad used to drive me out there with a bunch of other high-level guys from Jersey and Delaware and Pennsylvania and Maryland, and, and we would go uh, actually sleep in his basement. Uh, we would sleep in Kerry Collat's basement um, and, uh, and train with him over the weekends at, at that, that high school, St. Paul's. So Kerry Collat was a huge, huge, huge influence on my, my style and, and what I did. Um, I, I remember I used to wrestle with him and like, he's just one of those guys that couldn't even touch his legs. There's a few, there's a few coaches I've had that I could not even touch their legs. I'd never touched Kerry Collette's legs one time. And I wrestled with him so many times that I never even touched his legs. Um, and he used to wear sweats and man, we used, when we used to stay in his basement, he would have racks of his shoes on the back. I used to have a pair, um, racks of his, like, uh, his old North Carolina, like Kerry Collette. A6 or whatever they were. So, yeah, Kerry Collette's a big influence. I'm going through the list. I'm trying to go a little faster here. Sheldon Thomas was a big one. You guys can look him up. Uh, he, he was a Delaware guy. He, he, was, a, he was older. He was a coach. Um, the, and then a couple families that I grew up with around. There's, there's big wrestling families around me. One of them was the Wilkinson families. Um, always appreciate those guys, man. We, we didn't uh, – I mean, maybe some of, the, some of the Wilkinsons we maybe ended up on, on not the best terms. Um, when I changed high schools and stuff, but uh, I, I always, always appreciate those guys so much, man. Um, they were, a, they were an Iowa, Iowa family, and uh, and they had mats in their houses, and I learned a lot from those guys and, and their son Bo. Um, and then the Sailor family was another big family that that's where actually Ben we used to, or, uh, not Ben um, Daniel. That's where we used to go in the kerosene barn. Was at uh, the Sailors. It was at. Uh, Will Sailor, no, Luke Sailor's house. And so there's Mark Sailor, Will Sailor, Luke Sailor, Mark Sailor, Will Sailor, and then their father, and then Will Sailor's father. And they were um, they were a really, really good wrestling family, and I learned a lot about different things from them. Actually, the, the elbow pass that I do, my favorite elbow pass, is from Luke Sailor's dad, um, Joe, Joe Sailor. He's the one who taught me the uh, – He's the one that taught me that. And he used to grab me and he used to sit, talk like he smoked a pack of cigarettes a day like this. And he would grab me. And he said, PJ, you have to grab him like this. And I used to just feel pain when he touched me because he was so rough and his skin was so hard and his bones were so dense. And <laughs> he was just an old, old dude, man. And he would like grab me and he'd talk like this. And he would show me this thing and, and everything about it hurt. And I was like, this sucks. I think I have to learn this move. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's where I learned that back in like probably, you know, that was in ninth grade probably um, when I was like 14 or 15. 
Um, Brett Metcalf, I used to watch a lot on, uh, <clears throat> I used to watch Brett Metcalf. He was one of the few guys on the senior national tapes, um, that I used to watch over and over. I watched him and, uh, geez, I can't forget. I can't remember the guy's name, but he was in the senior national finals and Metcalf, I learned a lot about and, and about just grinding and, and things like that. He's, he's an incredible, incredible wrestler. And the last and, and probably one of the more important ones was my college wrestling coach, John Sussman. I wasn't with him for long. Uh, we actually, we actually butt heads a lot. I wasn't ready to learn at that point in my life. And I wasn't ready to be um, what he needed, you know, uh, physically and stuff. And, and I think everything else was there, but mentally I wasn't, I wasn't prepared to, to buy into what he was selling me. And, uh, and if I had been, I would have, I would have been a good wrestler in college. But uh, I wasn't I wasn't ready for for what he was he was uh, willing to give or wanting to give to me. But he he was an incredible coach. Um, I've learned a lot from him, and and I wish I could you know someday like take take some of those things that he did as a coach and things like that and, and use them in, in jujitsu to to be as, as good a coach as he is. Um, so John Stutzman, you guys can look him up. I think he's at. Uh, mm, Somewhere in New York now. I don't know. One of the one of the universities. So good question, man. There's there's so many more guys too. There's so many more important people and things like that. So that was just a, a short list. Hopefully, I didn't bore you guys too much already. Uh, and then so the the next question, fight following uh, lose connection. You guys, or we got we're good. We're good on connection. Hang on, hang on. Uh, Scotty, put that question in the Discord, Scott. Save that, man, because because I got I got some stuff to get through here, man. You guys are here though, no? I think we're good now. <clears throat> what is your mindset pre post fight following a win and loss? Okay, there's a layers to this question. Also, how do you and or manage pre fight adrenaline dumps? Okay, so that's from Alan Dallas Reyes. It's a good question, man. It's it's super layered. There's so much going on there. Um, I made some notes, tried to like simplify it just a little bit. Um, so the first, the first thing that I, I, I really focus on because the, the nerves and the pre-fight adrenaline dump, it started, it started months before you compete. It started a long time before you competed. And, uh, <sighs> that's why if you guys ever see me doing weird things with, with headphones on in the back by myself or something like that on some mats or wrestling around or whatever, I'm not really like, I mean, I'm moving and doing things, but what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm in a, a headspace where I'm, I'm visualizing, uh, I'm visualizing where I'm going to compete, who's going to be there, everything. I'm seeing it over and over and over again. I'm seeing that moment and I'm feeling those nerves over and over and over again. It's, it's basically like exposure therapy, right? If anybody's into psychology, there's something called exposure therapy, and uh, that's that's what it is. I'm I'm exposing myself to that moment over and over and over again, so that when it hits, I'm not overwhelmed by it. And uh, and I already saw it a thousand times. You know, that's that was like a that's a big part of it is, is exposing yourself. And, and uh, <sighs> yeah, you get next the next little note I put is. Uh, Second is, is uh, building confidence in your training and your training partner, right? So, like, just work as hard as me. You know what I mean? And just kind of replaying those kinds of things in your head because you need to work hard enough that you can say that with confidence to yourself. Like, this guy didn't do what I did. This guy didn't doesn't train with the people I train. This guy doesn't have that guy coaching me. You know, there's, there's those things. And then, and then you think about, like, man, who did I train with? Like, who's – who – like, man – I train with fucking killers. Is what's his, is what's his can what's his face do that to me? You know what I mean? Like I can do this to what's his name? So, you know, I think you guys get the point, right? Um, I think that might tie me into the next one. So I train with what oh, I'm trying to focus on the moment, not the result. Yeah. So that's another big thing, is just focusing on the moment, not the result. <sighs> when we when we get into like a a competition and things, the most important thing you can do. And it's it's a it's a total mindset shift is focusing on on the moment that you're in, okay, and and not the result of that moment, okay, not the win or the loss. Focusing on your friends that are there with you, your crew, you know what I mean? Those people that are there with you, those people that 
because it's it's a solo sport out here, man. But but you need your teammates more than anyone else in any other sport. Like with like bar none, man. Pete, your teammates are so freaking important. But then you go out there all by yourself, and you just have to have those people with you, man. And and like feel them, man. Feel them in that moment. Do that for them. Do that for 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 other 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 people, and and, and be in that moment of like, okay, we're in this fucking gymnasium. Uh, I'm doing. I'm a thing with these people, and, and you know, and just feel that whole moment. You know, like let it like, resonate and and. And everything uh, kind of build up to that one moment, and then just feel it like, like, damn, we're here. We fucking did this. Now it's time. It's time to put on a show for those people, those people that we we trained with and worked so hard with. It's time to time to time to perform for them. You know what I mean? And and nobody cares about the result, dude. Nobody, nobody like. Look at uh, like look at. A guy like Nick Diaz. Okay, I know it's a super obvious example, but he he has a probably like almost a losing record, you know. But everybody wants to watch him, and it's not just because he like talks shit or is a certain way or whatever. It's because of the way he fights too, and uh, and people are, are are keen to that, you know. That he doesn't he doesn't he's not focused so much on the wins and the losses. He's he's out there he's out there trying to to put on a show, and he's out there trying to perform and he's out there trying to uh to fight just fucking fight you know what i mean and people uh, like they feel that they sense that and that and that shows in his performance and and people just want to see a, you know people aren't aren't as nearly as concerned with your record and and that's why more people will tune in to see somebody like who was undefeated for like like steven mailchich or, or something or even john jones you know like people are kind of like eh, you know after he stopped performing so much and focused more on winning Less people are concerned with watching John Jones, uh, and that's this shift in mindset from him because he he's got to hold on to that title. And you know, I don't blame him. It's strategy. You know what I mean? But focusing less on the win or the loss and and more on the on the on the like the being in the moment and enjoying that. When I was when I when I did EBI, I'll never forget when I did EBI for the first time because that was a big goal of mine coming up up into this and. I remember being on the stage there and uh, that was the first time I ever really got like fully, fully emotional and I was up there um, and I've, I, and I, and I, and I went through just this whole fuck it because I didn't train for a month and a half before EBI. I didn't even step foot on the mats besides to, to teach. And I was only running for my cardio and things like that. I was injured. So I, I couldn't do anything. And, and, I like could have broke, you know, like I could have broke. I decided I was going to no matter what, man, when I was up there, I just didn't care about the result anymore. I just cared. I was there. Hold on. I think, let me know when we're back. I think we're back. I think we're back guys. Uh, I don't know if the Wi-Fi is bad here or not, but I just cared about the moment that I was in right there at that moment. I remember looking out and I remember seeing my friends and family and, and, and teammates and all these people, man. And I, uh, I started to, to tear up, you know, I was like, I was welling up and I was kind of crying up there on the stage. And, and that was just like, it was just a big moment for me because I didn't give a fuck if I won or lost, but I was up there, man. And I was doing this shit and I was going to do it for them. You know what I mean? And I was going to fucking put on, cause I didn't know what was going to happen. Cause I hadn't trained in so long, but I was just going to, uh, I was going to put it all on the line. You know what I mean? That was, that was the, that was the plan and I was going to do it for them. So, uh, that's just soaking in the moment, you know, and you can do that anywhere, any, any moment any people paul this is paul yeah paul jacob pj butter panther who's this safe bag um and then let's just talk about real quick after a loss because me from school it's me jahan okay from school i'm not sure man i'm not sure brother <clears throat> um Anyways, moving on. When you lose, you can end up being your own uh, your own biggest critic. You know, it's it's uh, it can make or break somebody. And uh, if you're if you're I think we're getting trolled right now, guys. <laughs> I think we're definitely getting trolled. Let me see if I can. Uh... 
kick this guy out. Whatever. I'll let him run. I'll let him go. I'm not going to figure it out. Anyways, um, that could, that moment can make or break you, and uh, it's not it's not always sensitive. You know, you can't. It's not for, for sensitive people, man. Oh, and also you can get a you can get a you can get a match in before your match. That's another big part of this. Like we're all losing we're losing people here. We're losing people here. So another another big way to to get this like to get this out is is to uh is to get a match in before your match, right? That's something that I figured out a long time ago was was being able to to get a match in before your first match because everybody knows that adrenaline dump happens in the first match. So if you if you get that out of the way early, then then you'll be you'll be better off for it for sure. <laughs> Biggest turn off. Danny Flores, what is your biggest turnoff in your opinion in the jiu-jitsu community? This can be answered in any context, styles, comps, rolling, ideology, etc. <clears throat> Guys, hang tight for one second. I'm definitely a noob at this. Paul, you don't know because he's calling me Paul. Yeah, we went to school together. Click on the name and three dots. So I'm going to the name, dude. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, okay, perfect. Time out or remove? I think. Yeah, he's he's gone. I think. I don't know what that was about, man. But he didn't. He definitely didn't know me because he's he was calling me uh, Paul, which is pretty weird. Nobody called me Paul in school, <clears throat> so I don't think it was a troll. Anybody that we know, troll. Interesting. Okay. All right, we're moving on, guys. The from Danny Flores, the biggest turnoffs in jujitsu. Okay, this is a complex question for me. Um. And uh, honestly, I appreciate like a lot. I appreciate like a lot of a lot of different things about about like jujitsu and how it operates. You know, there's there's so many sides, and I see a lot of different sides, and and I and I appreciate them all from just sitting here as a spectator's point of point of view for it. You know, um, I love the the friendly banter and the shit talking. Um, I'm I'm definitely a fan of it, you know. I think I think it's cool. Um, it's it's a sport, you know, and in sport, that's a vital part of sport, you know, and, and I like that. Um, but then there's also the art of jujitsu too, and that's why it's such a it's such a cool cool sport, man. Um, jujitsu has so many facets to it, and I appreciate as well the people that are representatives of the art. You know, um, those guys that can focus on, on, on art of things and, and not just, and not be shit talkers and, and maybe like a little more old school or, or Japanese style to it. Um, it's so culturally diverse, this sport, you know, and there's, and there's so many different things that are, you know, it's like, it's this Japanese thing that is from Brazil that is now in America and so it has all these flavors to it from different places, and uh, and it's really interesting. And we'll get both. I like I like the Meow Brothers um, and their their approach to things and their their artistic uh, thought processes behind it, and and their respect and and, and honor, and uh, you know, their what is uh, no sad stories, you know, no excuses and no sad stories and. No, no, no bullshit. You know what I mean. And I like that. And I also like like uh, 
all the guys at Henzo's like, you know, having banter with each other and, and talking crap and, and bringing eyes to the sport and all that stuff, you know, there's, there's always limits to it. And, and that should be considered. Um, but it's all fun, man. It's all fun. And I, and I enjoy it. Um, I don't think it ruins the sport in any type of way. And I think that room for all of it in, in Jiu Jitsu, I think there's room for, for both sides and, and representatives of all of it, you know what I mean? Sport and an art first. Um, I think we should keep it kind of pure in that sense. And, and as a result, money can be, be made, you know what I mean? Because there is a value to this, to this thing that we do. So, um, <clears throat> I think putting money first is, is the, is the wrong Okay, sorry. I think I was just saying that, like putting putting money first is is the wrong approach in my mind, and that's a turnoff to me um, in a lot of different ways. It, it shouldn't be something that is used for for money, right? It should be money should be a result of that, and then also like you know someone of in in power or uh, someone in power or a higher belt or some an owner of a school or something like that that is using that to their advantage. That's a that's a major. That's not just a major turnoff, but it's probably illegal or something like that in a lot of senses too. So I think uh, respect um, for someone that can beat you up, you know, and and someone that you look up to, and uh, and that can be abused just as easily. And I've seen it happen, you know, like on smaller, on on smaller. Sorry, I don't know. I, I think uh, maybe the Wi-Fi is not great. I'm not sure. Keep letting me know though, because because I'll I'll try to fix it if it keeps if it keeps going bad with the connection. But all I was saying, guys, is that like you know, just people to be humble, man, and don't abuse abuse this thing that we have. If if you guys are good at jujitsu and and somebody is like, um, just be aware, you know, there's there's freaking people out there that will that will abuse their their power or whatever, you know. It's kind of like it's a thing of life, you know. This shit happens. So, um, okay. So again, I love all styles and rule sets for jujitsu. <clears throat> um, but I don't like necessarily people gaming rule sets for jujitsu. Um, there are people that will, um, game no matter what rule set it is. And there's just a difference between strategy and stalling, you know, and a strategy and cheating. Um, I know people like Chael or whatever, and, and different people say like, if you if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying, whatever things like that. But I like integrity, and I like uh, I like sport. I like things clean, and I like uh, I like people that that do things the correct way. And and uh, <clears throat> that's just my my opinion on things, you know. And, and there is of course strategy, man. You know, there's but there's a fine line between stalling, and there's a fine line between. Uh, stalling and, and strategy, you know? And so this, every rule set can be gamed from EBI rules where you can, uh, you know, lay, 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 lay like this, you know what I mean? And, and protect yourself for 10 minutes and then winning overtime or something like that. You know what I mean? That's, that's wrong. It's gaming the rules. And I, I, I wouldn't like that. You know, I mean? you might win, but you weren't making any friends. And then, um, cause like I said before, it's about performance. You know what I mean? It's not about wins and losses in the end. It's about performance, not making any friends doing that. And then the same goes for, uh, you know, any type of points rule sets where guys will, will just wrestle and back out or just stay in the stable and win by one advantage and things like that. That's been happening for many, many years. So that's not great either. Nobody wants to see that and nobody is going to appreciate somebody like people want to see guys that go out on their sword. You know, that's what, that's what we're in this for is, is for, for those types of things things and stuff you know that's what we look up to um and it doesn't sh display the full spectrum and utility of of what jiu-jitsu is okay um <clears throat> big pet peeve is people that compete in a rule set and blame that rule set that's a huge pet peeve of mine i really really don't like that do you guys know if there's a time limit on this because we're already at 40 40 minutes and i gotta do techniques still and stuff and i've been talking a lot um just let me know in the chat um yeah people that people that blame the rule set they do a rule set and then they blame it that's not good people that ignore 50 percent of the human body either half um whether it's the top half or the bottom half because there's people that do both you know what i mean there's people that don't do leg locks at all and uh there's people that only do leg locks so um there's a there's a harsh awakening to both of those and uh 
it'll happen unless you just stay in your bubble. Then it'll never happen, I guess. But it could happen to you. Oh, and one more thing. People that can't wrestle that wrestle for 10 minutes. Not that, like, I appreciate people trying to wrestle. I'm a wrestler. If somebody's not wrestling with me, I pull guard on them. Because that's because I, I like to display jiu-jitsu and I like to practice jiu-jitsu. And, uh, and I don't care about how much. It's, it's much less about the, the win or loss. And it's about me. Uh, sorry, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how long how long I lost you guys for. But it's not, it's not it's not so much like I said about. It's more about the performance and it's about using technique. And and I'm not gonna. Um, okay, I can go live for twelve hours. Cool. I won't. <laughs> Anyways, just you know, keep trying to do jujitsu. Don't stall. Okay. Um, Cool. We are on the technique section. Let me get Josh. And I'm doing this from my computer, guys. So, uh, yeah. Let me get Josh. Hey, Josh. Can I use the technique? Thanks, buddy. All right. Let's see. This might work. Yeah, this might work. I'll do my best here, guys. Um, I got Josh here with me. Uh, most some of you guys, most of you guys know Josh. Um, I don't. <laughs> the lot. Hey, the lockdown series. By the way, somebody just said uh, Daniel Linus hashtag lockdown the world, and so they already know this guy. We are going to put on lockdown content. So you guys, <laughs> you guys, just wait, just wait. Okay, turn off. Okay, this is a technique question from Alejandro. Which one is your go-to takedown against somebody who can actually wrestle and has a pretty good base and top pressure? Dem, please. Okay, this is a tough one for me because, um, you know, it, like as with anything and, and wrestling, especially and things like that, it's not it's not about necessarily what you do; it's about how you do it. You know what I mean? Because something that works for me might work entirely different for you. Um, and uh, the question too is a little bit strange because. Maybe you can even clarify for me because you said actually wrestling has a pretty good base and top pressure, but top pressure I don't understand because we're wrestling. So are you just talking about somebody that can wrestle you back pretty well or, or just somebody that's heavy? Um, I don't know if you want to clarify that or not, but I'll show you what I was going to show you anyways. Cause I was going to, I was going to say I like to do single legs and that's just me personally because I'm, I feel like I'm a single leg guy because like I said, I wasn't always the fastest or most athletic person. So like, I didn't feel like double legs were really my thing. You know, you see a guy like Jordan Burroughs, like, of course, he's going to be good at, at double legs. Um, he's incredibly fast and quick. And uh, and I didn't. Yes. And you don't want to. Okay. If uh, if I'm here and I pass the elbow here, okay, we've, we've done this in class so many times. Right. But I'm just talking about a couple things. So, like, if I. Like this is just me personally, right? I would I will pass. I would touch here, and as he steps back or something, I'm already swinging to this side, right? Or if I elbow pass here, okay, and as I elbow pass, he circles away from it this way. I'm already here. Okay, you guys see where I'm at? My, I'm I'm not underneath of this guy. Okay, if I if I had sprawled on somebody with a good pressure and I was here, I might run into some problems. But at this angle now. I feel a lot better. And look, I can already stand right up and I'm already out of his zone. Does that make sense to you? Sorry. I wish I had a better, I wish I had a better answer to that question. Um, but I would focus on being technical and I would focus on, on, on staying out from underneath of him. So I would focus on single legs. Um, I think that's a good idea for you. Um, and that was just my favorite setup, the elbow pass right there. If you, you know, if you wanted to get like even more technical and you, you say you don't want to be on top of you're having trouble wrestling somebody, you don't want to pull guard, but like there's ways of pulling guard in the single leg. Look at Damian Maya, you know what I mean? That's that's a whole other thing. But hopefully the is it just clearing the knee line or is there more? Dot dot dot. I'll see if that on training partner is not stopping fully. Okay, we got a we got a couple quite like couple layers to this question. I think First and foremost, the way that I want to approach this is, is I want you guys to understand that if you want to get good at heel hooks, it's really quite simple. Okay, cool. Um, all I was saying was that uh, there's a lot of layers to what 
Daniel asked me, but basically if, if in a real, like where you want to, like how you're going to get good to heel hooks right now is you're going to find partners and you're going to put yourself in the pocket and you're going to stay in the pocket. Okay. That's the first thing I need to tell you guys. Like you guys just have to like get with people. Okay. That you trust that you train with that you don't have any ego or you don't have anything to prove against. And you just need to get in the pocket with them. Okay. That's what you should be doing. Not looking to win on, on submissions because you're not winning shit back here in the gym. Okay. All, all you need to do is, is trying to perform techniques on each other. Okay. Does that make sense? There's a difference between subbing somebody and performing techniques on them. And that's how your, your mindset should be. How can I aggressively perform technique on my partner instead of how can I aggressively attack a submission on somebody? Look at this freaking guy. <laughs> this is this guy. Okay, I removed him. All right. There's somebody, there's somebody like trolling, man. I don't know who he is. Some guy's just in there trolling. Um, so, man, how did I go over here? Okay, this was, this was a lot of layers. Securing, best way to secure the hero. In the pocket. I'll show you what in the pocket means. Why is this guy? I don't know. I'm trying, man. <laughs> I just hit him from the chat. I guess that's fine. Okay. Um, in the pocket. This is what I mean by in the pocket. Okay. Let's say instead of like um, I start the pass here, okay, and uh, some kind of way I, I just I just sit here, I sit back and I go into this, okay. And now for both guys to now pummel instead of instead of um, instead of just trying to clear the knee line and get out and kick out, you know what I mean. So if, if Josh had my leg here, get my leg in some kind of capacity here, let's see here, okay, whatever, we're on fifty fifty. Instead, fifty fifty is really hard to clear out of, okay. 50 is really hard to clear up in general, but like what, what I might do is, is something like just staying in this and protecting my legs. You know what I mean? Trusting my partner isn't going to, isn't going to hurt me here if he does catch it. Right. And then I try to pummel into something else and I'm here. You know what I mean? I'm here pummeling. He clear, he clears his knee line. There you go, there you go. He clears his knee line. I switch off and I go here. You know what I mean? And then, and then Josh clears and, and puts me into some kind of a, a leg, leg entanglement or something like that. Boom, we're here in double outside Ashi. Now, instead of clearing this double outside Ashi and just trying to trying to rip and kick out and spin out as fast as I can, here's what I do. I kind of trust this position and I take a breath. And I think, okay, what? I got to fight the hands here. Now maybe I'll throw this leg over here. Okay, now I'm here fighting with this leg as well. Okay, now what? Maybe I'm starting to control this leg. Oh, shoot. Now now we just reverse the position and we're here, right? A good Another good example of, like, like staying in the pocket. Josh is leaving the pocket because he's clearing his knee back in. Okay, but yeah, so okay. Sometimes you have to clear the knob. Another good way to clear the to stay in the pocket is if I'm in this inside inside Ashi right here. Okay, if I didn't want to clear my knee line, I could just peel and back inside from here. You know what I mean? Flip it over here. Now I'm in this honey stick position. So that's what I mean by staying in the pocket and not just immediately sitting. Okay. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I'll, I'll figure that out later. I think I just, I think I just muted his uh, comments or whatever. Okay, so what I was saying though, the best way to secure heel hook, there's two ways. Okay, there's two ways of doing this. First, everybody always thought it was about control first. Now, and uh, people are getting people are getting way more keen to that, right? About it was about control before. Maybe I wanted to get and I wanted to get here and I wanted to get to this perfect position here first. And then start to attack the legs. And still great. It's a great idea. Really good idea. Okay. Great. Like good control. But man, it's hard to find the it's hard to find the heel all the time now. Because guys are really good at defending. So so what people are getting good at now is catching the heel first and then finding a way to transition legs into the knee line. You know what I mean? So if I'm here some kind of way and we're doing something and I get a hold of the heel, I grab and come in, boom. Okay. And then I made my then I found the control after I already had the false grip. So false grip always comes first. Sorry. Guys. Right. False grip always comes first. Achilles grab is, is second. You know, th these are just really general, general, like basic principles here, right? From here, Achilles grab with my free hand almost always. Okay. 
and false grip. Once I get a false grip, now I can let go of the Achilles because I have it with this one. Okay, and then as far as grips go, like, um, of course, like a gable, you want to have your form in line with the foot. Okay, you don't want to have it in line with the, the, the leg here. Okay, you want to make a, a gable grip. A gable grip's okay. A full full uh, butterfly. butterfly grip here. Okay, you can do cross grips here. You can do uh, switch grips like this. So there's a lot of different grips and stuff. Guys, it's there's a lot to it. Um, hopefully that was there were some helpful helpful things in there for you. Um, are you pinching your thighs the whole time? Not really. Okay, that's that's not really like you want to to be bridging your hips against every every hill positioning is a little bit different, right? And and some you want to have um, you want to have your your legs not pinched at all, like the opposite actually. You'd want to have it. it uh, open so that you're bridging into the opposite side of where you're trying to, to tear at the knee. Does that make sense? My partner just left. But <clears throat> like if I'm in that inside triangle position, I'm not pinching my knees here. I'm bringing my feet together like this so I can bridge up into his knee like this. Okay. The control from, comes from me hooking his leg here and bridging into it. Um, but every, every position is a little bit different. Sometimes there is a pinch on outside ones, especially. Yes, you didn't see, but I nodded the whole time. Cool. Thanks, Daniel. Um, and uh, I, hope that, I hope that makes some sense. Okay. We're, we're really like, you know, you'd have to get an instructional or something. But hopefully there's, there's a couple little things you're picking up here. Um, fight grips first. So this is for defense, I think. Um, and I think this is kind of like Julian Navar Navarro's next question. Just double check. Because I think uh, Benassi's questions, or no, so keep on them, man, because it's a big up in Um Daniel, Daniel asked these questions, and then Julian Navarro said, when trying to get out of a hook, do you turn in any direction to avoid getting caught? Okay, so <laughs> that's uh kind of ties in, right? Um, the way that I think I, I kind of wanted to answer it was, so... If you're deep, okay, the first thing you need to do is fight the hands. Which my partner didn't leave. It was bad timing. Okay. The first thing you want to do is, is fight the hands if you're performing really cool techniques and stuff. So <clears throat> catching like uh, catching a heel and getting a grip on a heel with somebody that you trust, there's, there's only – you want to fight the hands. You always have to fight the hands, you know, and, and rarely on an inside triangle do you want to fight the hands because a lot of times it's already done, okay, unless it's one of those ones where you're kind of in there. You want to fight the hands on the outside, outside, uh, like double outside Ashi, always if, if they catch the heel, and the same with a 50-50 um, because you can easily reach their hands, okay. Um, let me go get Josh. <laughs> All right, well, he's actually busy. Sorry. Um, I don't have like a dummy in here or anything, but okay. So you have to fight the hands first. That's your first line of defense if you're already really deep. Um, <clears throat> the uh, outside Ashi position, which a lot of you guys should know, is one where you can fight the hands pretty easily because you can sit up into them. The same with 50-50, I can sit up into them so I, so I can fight the hands once I'm in there and I can kind of kick myself through. Um, the the inside triangle position for hill hooks is a little bit more difficult because when I'm here on a, an opponent and I have his leg in my, in my legs here, okay, this is wedged in between us. So it's hard for him to, to sit up into me to fight the hands. And when he fights the hands, he wants to get a hold of this hand and near him. Okay, you hug that. He gets a hold of it and he pulls it to him right here. And and that false grip that I have is rarely going to be enough if you can kick and heel slip. It's called a heel slip. Okay. If I sat up into a guy here and I got a hold of his, his front hand and I, and I hooked it and pulled it into me, I could then kick and straighten my heel and that's called a heel slip. I don't got that. You're fine. Josh, Josh is back. So... Um, let me just let me just put you in a, or put me put me in a 
inside inside of China. Yeah. Let's turn this way. So look, guys, well, like I was saying, it's, it's hard. Go ahead and get a false grip on that. Boom. Okay, you guys can see it's, it's difficult for me to reach his hand so well right here. But if I'm already deep like this, man, this is like a position to probably tap in. Okay. But in some cases, you know what I mean? If I can get a hold of this one and I can kick or, or something like that, I can heel slip. Okay. And then, like, to follow Julian Navarez's question is, like, like the second line is, is probably to almost always point your, your heel in the opposite direction of where he wants it. You know what I mean? If if uh, but let me show you really quick first. 50-50. Okay, let's go to 50-50. If he has my my heel locked up in 50-50, okay, this is a different story because look at how close I am to him to fight the hands. Yeah, if I fight the nice hands price. here, yeah. So you can feel a lot more comfortable fighting the hands at 50-50 than in, in an inside yeah, triangle. Let's put two on crazy exactly. saying all that stuff too. Yeah. And so and the same goes for outside ashi. He puts me in outside ashi and gets a gets a hold of my foot, like a bite on my heel. I can sit up into this guy pretty easily right here. Okay. I can sit up into a guy pretty easily right here, get a hold of this hand first, and then I can use my free hand, free leg to kick out. Right. And then I can start to attack. There's really, you have three options when it comes to escaping hooks, right? First is like immediately clear the knee line and immediately get out. Um, The second is is repummeling, okay, and staying in the pocket. Repummeling and staying in the pocket. That's another way you can you can battle a heel hook, right? A lot of times it still includes like clearing an line first. Um, and then the third would be like taking the back, which a lot of times requires you to clear your line as well. So those are kind of the two way, the three ways that I think about getting out of a heel hook. Um, which way you turn is kind of like, man, that's a tough question, Julian. So like. Uh, Obviously, you want to turn away from the heel hook. You know, if, if he if he cinched me in right here, I gotta get out. I gotta go that way. But like, man, you guys will notice that it's like it's almost done at that point. Very, very rarely do like unless unless I'm pretty close to clearing my knee line in some type of way. As I turn, put me in an inside triangle here. Okay. If he if he if he was here and I and he got a hold of that, he had a bite already, and I started and he started to turn this way with it, turn into it. Yeah, here, but I can turn and slip my knee line as I go. I might go for it, especially in a match or especially with somebody I trust. But I don't recommend it all the time. You know what I mean? But that's that's why we, we roll with people we trust. And like I said, we, we stay in the pocket and we try these things out because we just have to trust our partner and, and not turn the wrong way and just kind of feel things out a lot. You just have to spend a lot of time there. Yeah. Um, One thing that I think, and I want your opinion on this, is that when anybody has me in a heel hook, like put me in any type of heel hook, I'm always turning, obviously, like turning my heel into your body, uh -huh. right? So I'm always trying to turn my heel into your body. So if you pummel it this way and you try to lock it that way, I'm turning my heel in. That's usually the way I'm going to roll to. So yeah. like if you're trying to go for that heel and I turn it this way, I'm usually going to roll this way. But that can get me caught worse sometimes, right? Like the way Craig Jones shows it, when you step over and run away, it's like a super nasty heel hook. Is it better? It's better for me to run this way? Um out of a 50 50 you're talking or well, really outside? anyway like you could be in honey hole or go honey hole right and then i'm turning into your so i would want to run this way is that wrong yeah generally generally it is wrong. okay so no generally off. that's right generally. that's right okay so whatever way my heels go into your body is yeah. what I'm uh, okay most of them okay cool <laughs> Um, there was some stuff in that. There's some things and, and things like that that I'd like to get into, but I don't, I don't want to like bog you guys down. Cause there, there is a couple things that I noticed right there and things that we could have talked about. But I, if I don't have like a direct, clear train of thought on it, then I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into it right now. Cause we're already an hour in. Um, so yeah, best advice I wrote down here in all caps is get in the pocket and stay in there. Do you guys have any questions on the old stuff? I know it's a lot. There's some complicated stuff right there. Um, it's just going to take some time. If not, are you guys all still there? You guys there? Give me some no Fs in the chat. I'm assuming people are there. Yeah. All right. Here's the last thing. This was for Alan. Alan asked me about what I can do out of 50-50 uh, here. And um, Alan asked me what I can do out of 50-50 besides um, – Heel hooks, right? But let's say that uh, I do I do wind up at fifty fifty here, and I just wanna I wanna get out, or I wanna because um, one thing I can do is go to eighty twenty, right? I can go to eighty twenty and start to try to clear that leg out. Okay. I can also stand up, 
Okay, especially if I want points or a sweep, I want to stand up. But then I have to think about some like a couple other things about like him not finding my heel, him not taking my back, and different things like that. And then the other thing I can do is, is possibly a back take off of it. So the two things that I look for the most when I'm not heel hooking a guy out of 50-50 is either a back take or or to come up. Okay, and I'll show you both. First, I'll do the back take because I think it's really simple. Okay, let's say if I'm here. And all I need to do is get space in order to get this leg across his body. All right. And a lot of times, maybe I'm in here and I'm fighting some kind of way or something like that. And I bring in, I kick. And I just see an opportunity for me to bring that across. Okay. Because a lot of times the guy's sitting up into you here, which is a smart thing to do. Okay. But if I can see some kind of an opportunity to create some space and kick and then bring that leg across, that's what I'll do. And before he can even catch it, I'll start to bring my heel to my butt. And I'll start to sit up into him. This way. Like, he's turning to try to find the foot. Right and I'm here. coming into him this way. Okay. So right here, I actually did this on the Freaks website, this this back back take. But I'm going to go ahead and C cup right here on his calf and push. And I'm going to grab his trap here. And if I'm having trouble with the heel, I'll use his foot to kick. But I'm just going to start scooting, scooting, scooting for the back. Right. And then I'll, I'll sit him up. That was a really simple rendition of it, but basically just passing your leg from 50-50 into double outside and then coming off for a real traditional back take there. Okay. So the second thing for 50-50, and I haven't uh, necessarily taught this in class yet, is this. Okay. Right, let's turn it over. So first, like when I'm in 50-50, <laughs> I wanna I wanna keep my, my heel because if he's if he's reaching back, especially like trying to look for the heel and stuff like that, I wanna keep my foot turned and planted. You guys see how it's turned and planted right there? That's important. And and as I come up, one of the worst things I could do when I come up, especially with somebody that's good for 50-50, is have my foot in here. Okay, because if I have my foot in here when I come up, he can rotate under me. Right? Like that? Sort of. Yeah. And see how that exposes my heel? Okay, you guys probably couldn't see that too well, but try try one more time. So if my foot's down here next to his hip, yeah, see how he rotates under? That exposes my heel, and then I'm in a, a like a pretty gnarly heel hook right there. So when I stand up, I want my foot planted and my toes pointed out and my foot into his armpit up here. So what I'll do is I'll be here, I'll be here, and I'll drive my feet together like this up into his armpit like this. Okay, and then I plant, and I get into this techno get-up position right here. So now as he digs or tries to go under or anything like that, you guys can see there's not much he can do right there. Okay, it's really hard for him to come up and under this. Now, as I come up, okay, I want to turn my butt, but I don't want to turn my butt too much because if I turn my butt too much into him, he can bring this back foot and hook my leg right here. Now this becomes a little bit of an issue. It's called a monkey hook. Okay, so I don't want to turn that far. I want to come up, and as I come up right here, okay, I want to start hand fighting and I want to scoop. So lock your legs up quick for me. Yeah, if he's if he's locked, especially like this, I want to scoop up and under these two legs. Okay. I want to scoop up and under his legs. And then I'll start to drive and use my hips to get him stacked up. Sorry. So we're here and it's locked. And after I come up, I want to scoop under and use my hips. Scoop under and use my hips. And then I want to start pushing here, pushing, 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 stacking. And what I'm looking for is just the opportunity to step over this one and then pass. That would be a really nice way to handle that. Okay. Questions, dude, leave it open. I'll leave uh, Josh. Josh will stay here for a minute um, for any uh, technique questions, but you guys can ask me anything if you want, if you're still here, I really appreciate you guys sticking around, man. This is cool. Had people in here for an hour and 10 minutes now. Um, uh, a little tired. That was fun, though. I really I really enjoyed uh, this live stream, man. I'll probably post it up on YouTube so people can see it. And, uh, yeah, I appreciate you guys all tuning in, man. <clears throat> um, Boogie's doing a Zoom class tomorrow. 
and uh, and I'll be doing one the next day after that. So I have a lot more questions to ask it to answer in the Discord. So maybe I'll do one of these um, two a week. Probably do two a week. And uh, this was a trial run, so I didn't really promote it too much to to anybody outside of uh, Tenth Planet Spring Valley. <clears throat> but um, as we as we go and do these a little bit better and stuff like that, I'll let everybody tune in. And then, and then we'll kind of see, but I'll keep the questions for mostly uh, people in the Discord and, and 10th Planet Freaks and things like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, appreciate you guys tuning in, man. I, I hope you enjoyed it. And, uh, and and I really appreciate everybody that showed up. And, and I appreciate you guys sticking with me through all this. And I hope you guys all stay safe out there and, and uh, expect some good news coming up as, as far as uh, training soon. And, you know, just, just staying in there. I'm, I'm pretty pretty talked out already, guys. So uh, I'm going to log out. Okay. Thank you guys. Oops. Oops.